Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Amy Wald, and today we have Meredith Marine, and she is doing really groundbreaking work in the hospitality industry. We're going to tell you all about Um, She's a hospitality entrepreneur with a background in social work and community organizing, and she is the founder and CEO of Vegan Hospitality, which is the largest worldwide professional vegan consultant network. That is amazing. Hi, Meredith. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, You know, today we are going to discuss... Meredith, your motivation for this endeavor, where this sparked from, uh, and how really incorporating vegan menus not only is meeting that demand, uh, but meeting the demand and enhancing sustainability commitments and also the growing, booming wellness uh, tourism industry right now. Um, We're also going to talk about the intersection of, as I just mentioned, whoops, food and the explosion of wellness travel and then really some practical tips on how you can get started, how you can start thinking about that. And of course, we will not leave out how you can help um, hotels and maybe tourism destinations start incorporating this and maybe even certify. So let's get into it, Meredith. How how did this all come about? And did you know your work in the past um, help you with this? Or was this a complete pivot from that? Tell us all about it. Wow. Thank you for asking. You know, I never thought I would be in hospitality. I didn't go to culinary school. I didn't have the traditional entry into hospitality. I started, like you said, as a social worker, I have a master's in social work and I did have an interest in food as a social worker. So I did my uh, social work thesis on, what was happening in the school system around school lunch in America and how food affects our mood and affects child behavior around the nutrition that is being offered to students. So I had this interest in food and food justice, and I worked in New York City early in my career doing community organizing around school wellness and community wellness, and that did lead me to do some cooking demonstrations for chefs and for local restaurants and community members. So I had a bit of a background that allowed me to transition, but it wasn't something that I had set my sights on. So what happened for me is that I ended up moving from New York City to this beautiful Caribbean island of Aruba, where I live today. And that's because of my family. I met my husband when I was on vacation. So I have already a background in tourism, but that's a personal background, not a professional background. Uh, But it greatly influenced my life and my trajectory. And when I moved to Aruba, I became a professor at the university in the social work uh, department. So I was teaching social work, community organizing, community empowerment, advocacy, psychology. And at the same time, I was living my own life as a vegan person, uh, trying to get my needs met. And also as a new mom and having a vegan family in a country that really wasn't aware of what the word vegan meant or even vegetarian as far as what's being served within the hospitality industry. So in order to just personally get my own needs met, I needed to advocate for myself and I needed to be very clear on what those needs were and actually be able to explain them to other people in simple ways that would allow me to live a life that was in line with my values. So that looked like calling restaurants in advance just in order to go out to eat. Sometimes it looked like explaining to the chefs where to buy vegan food, so where to buy tofu, and then how to cook it, and then communicating with the servers when I arrived to make sure that I got the right food, and speaking to the servers and speaking to the chefs after I ate to thank them, give them feedback, and this went on for months, so trying to figure out how do I navigate this lifestyle where I don't have to cook three meals a day, (laughs) every single day, what if I get tired one day, you know, I have a family, maybe I want to go out to eat like everybody else. And through this process, I built a lot of relationships within the industry. I like to say that, you know, I I think we're all in hospitality, whether we're on one side of the coin or the other, we're either working as professionals or we're the customer. And both of those sides of of that coin is super important in 
what happens in the industry and driving the industry forward. So I had these experiences and at the same time, I decided to start a movement in Aruba to build community around the vegan lifestyle because I didn't know any other vegans. I actually didn't know anyone other than my husband and his family and really wanted to meet like-minded people. I have um, been vegan for eight years and I was vegetarian first. I went vegetarian 20 years ago in my first year in college. So I've been living this lifestyle a long time and really wanted to find people that could help me with with finding vegan products and really support the movement. So I started this movement. Uh, it got really popular, not just amongst the people that live in Aruba, but tourists, because it's a very touristic, tourism-friendly place. So I would have people messaging me, asking me where to eat, and how do they find the vegan food that I'm finding when I was having chefs make it for me off menu. Fast forward to me giving a presentation at the National Restaurant Association in Aruba to these owners of restaurants, to these chefs, and explaining from the customer perspective what's going on for us when we are served to the same pasta marinara at every restaurant, or when we are getting these, these mistakes coming out of the kitchen and having to send the food back, and explaining the difference between vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free, because these are often messed up in, in places where there is not a lot of education or training around dietary requests and allergies. So... Through that conversation with the restaurant association, through this presentation, I presented from the customer perspective. And at the end of this presentation, I had a line of restaurant owners and chefs standing in front of me, handing me their business card, asking me for help. And as a social worker, I, I truly believe that, you know, it's the community that should help themselves, right? I didn't want to come in as some American coming to another country and we're going to change your country and change your scene. And so I said, you know, this is for you to do. I'm encouraging you to label your menus. I'm encouraging you to create these dishes. They said, you know, we want to attract vegan guests. We see people are requesting this. We see this as a great market to get into. We don't know how to do it. And you do, and we need your help. So I said yes. When the first restaurant owner asked me to come and evaluate his menu and give him feedback, I said yes. And when he asked me to go to the supermarket and buy some tofu and teach the chefs how to use it because they had never seen tofu before, I said yes. And when he asked me to create an event to launch their new vegan menu, I said yes. And because of all that yes, so much happened over the course of the next few years. Aruba became recognized as the most vegan-friendly island in the Caribbean after me being in 15 or so kitchens in, in my first year of consulting. And we were able to organize with the tourism board a vegan press trip for influencers to come and promote the island as vegan friendly. Um, I was on magazines and really just so much happened within such a short span of time. People started asking me, how did you do this and how can I do this in my city, in my country? So I then started a program to train other vegans around the world to do this kind of work and to support the local industries in their communities. And that's where we're at now with having this large network of vegan consultants. I've trained people in over 25 countries and we just together launched the first hotel certification for hotels that welcome vegan guests. So it's been a very exciting whirlwind of the past seven years or so of my entry into the hospitality industry. Gosh, I love that is so fascinating because, you know, sometimes you know, services are born out of a consumer need. Um, mm -hmm. So as you were mentioning, you know, you have this need, you are a tourist, you are um, a hotel guest, a restaurant guest. And so therefore you um, were able to help them. And it really allows you, I think, to craft your offering so well tailored to that client because you've had to go in on the ground floor and really figure out what it is that would make them successful. Um, yes. Really, really fascinating. Congratulations. Thank you. The method that I now call high impact hospitality consulting was created through the work with the clients, through asking them, what do they need? And them telling me, you need to go show us how to use these products. Now we realized, okay, we need to train the servers to upsell these products, to explain these products to the guests. We need to Great ingredients booklets so that the guests can understand, you know, if they have allergies, what's in the food. We need to plan events around this. We need to do marketing and partnerships. So everything really was born out of the actual work. And I call this high impact consulting because I'm not working with people to create one vegan option. So I like to work with restaurants, resorts that are willing to create really excellent vegan culinary programming that allows the vegan guest to have the same quality experience as the traditional guest. And that's because the vegan guest usually once was the traditional guest. 
Like I said, you know, I went vegan when I was 18. I had 18 years of eating meat and dairy. I actually come from a family of butchers. So I am very aware of what I'm missing out on in the sense, which I don't feel I'm missing at any uh, in any way now. But sometimes um, I feel that chefs are expecting vegan customers to come in with very special requests or different or feeling, you know, like they have special needs. But actually, they might have been not vegan the year before when they visited your resort. And now this is their first year they've gone vegan. And they don't really know what to do. And they want you to walk them through it, you to walk them through what is an excellent vegan culinary experience. And you can have an integral role to play in their journey, uh, in their wellness journey, or in their sustainability journey, or in their ethical journey, the way that they've decided to live their life. And I think this is so interesting because, you know, this is the sustainable hospitality podcast, right? So maybe some people out there are thinking, what does vegan food have to do with sustainability? And, you know, sustainability is kind of the umbrella, right? Depending on what your value proposition is as an organization, where your culture is, where your location is, that really drives your sustainability initiatives and your strategy. And so maybe this is something that you foresee adopting, and it doesn't mean that you leave out um, the rest of the marketplace, but it means that you are paying attention to that customer. And now you have um, opened yourself up to be able to bring in that demand as well. So so it's just an additional offering that you can make. Um, you know, you mentioned something that I want to touch on too. You mentioned food justice. And again, this being about sustainability, I'm curious to know, um, you know, and for those people out there that don't know what food justice is, because it's kind of a new terminology. Um, would you maybe explain really quickly what that is? And then where do you see this intersecting, you know, vegan, vegan offering intersecting with food justice? What an interesting question. I don't think anyone has asked me about food justice in 10 years <laughs> since I was in my social work program. Um, and it's something I'm so passionate about. So Food justice has a lot of different aspects, and I won't cover everything here, but essentially, food justice centers around accessibility to food. So people, no matter what your race, ethnicity, level of income, social economic status, you should have access to food that nourishes your body, and that's really the center of it. There are communities we can call food deserts, perhaps, where they don't have access to the same kind of foods that other maybe more wealthy communities have. They maybe don't have grocery stores with fresh produce, or maybe there's not um, pricing accessibility for the kind of income that certain groups of people are um, experiencing in those neighborhoods. So it can be really challenging for people to nourish their bodies, nourish their families in certain neighborhoods where they are being marginalized and they don't have this just food system. So that's one aspect. There's also the farming aspect and what is happening in the lives of these farmers and the large companies that have monopolies over seeds. And there's a lot going on with farming, farming that can contribute to injustice in the food system. There's a lot going on in uh, animal agriculture that creates injustice and um, environmental harm to certain communities. And many times these are the more poor communities that have the slaughterhouses, that have the farming that has environmental um, concerns around the water runoff, around the chemicals being used in farming, and they come with health hazards. So there is so much that we could talk about with food justice. For me, my, my vegan project initially in the beginning was around inclusivity and making sure that everyone had a seat at the table. Um, you can say that I'm, I'm in it for the animals in the sense that I would love for animals to not be harmed. And every time someone's choosing a vegan dish, I feel wonderful about it because I know they're not eating animals. But really my initial concern and the platform of my company is to make the vegan lifestyle accessible and acceptable around the world. And yes, it started in Aruba and now we are global. So the goal is to make veganism accessible in that people can afford and access fresh produce, vegan uh, alternative proteins if they want that, and that anyone who wants to have a vegan meal when they're going out to eat can access that. So that essentially you're not forced to compromise your values or your health or your sustainability uh, desires when you go out to eat. And the acceptability portion of it is that we are treated just as anyone else so that our requests are normalized. And that in one, on one hand is actually maybe even harder than the accessibility part. And it comes 
along with it. So it involves training. And when I'm working with restaurants and resorts, we're not only working on menus. There is a huge staff training component. And um, yesterday, I actually just did a live staff training at a resort for their F&B team. And a lot of the information was new for them. And we get into a lot of detail around how the food on their menu is actually being made and processed. And just because you work in hospitality doesn't mean you have access to the details that maybe a vegan of 10 years would have access to. So these professional development opportunities, they not only help the customers that benefit from them, but actually they change the lives of the staff members that participate in these kind of programs. Oh, I love all of that. It's so amazing. And you know, food justice is one of those things that I, I think the majority of us living in the United States um, who are have have a lot of privilege and um, who are very fortunate can't even imagine and it just it literally rips my heart out to think that you know a, a food is something that every single one of us human beings on the planet should have access to and then you know to be able to have it inclusive if somebody does choose this for their lifestyle and their values that they are able to um, have that accessibility. But gosh, we're I was going to try to keep this shorter this time for our audience, but there is so much you're talking about that I love because not only does this enhance a, a guest's experience because now they know that they can access everything at a hotel, but the professional development element of it is huge. I mean, we are living in a time where now employees are choosing employers based on their values and what their offering is. And even like you're saying, professional development and their ability to grow um, as a professional and as a human being. So, so many great things there. All right, let's move on though, for the sake of time. Um, so how do you think, um, you know, incorporating a culinary program like this, the vegan culinary program, can contribute to sustainability, reduce the environmental impact of your restaurant or hotel? Talk to us about that because this is huge. You can reduce so much of your footprint. There, there's just so many positives to making sure that this is something that you are offering. Yes. So if anyone listening is not familiar with the connection between food and the environment and the environmental impact of livestock farming, I do encourage you to start Googling that because there's so much there. We could talk for hours on this and I can touch on a couple of links. So livestock farming is responsible for about 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions and beef and dairy are the biggest offenders. So if you are looking to make adjustments to your culinary programming, you really want to look at how much beef and dairy is on your menu, and specifically beef or, or veal as well, because cows are contributing to this um, greenhouse gas emissions and also to methane emissions. So if we want to make an impact on lowering CO2 and methane through the menu changes, then we want to look at reducing portion sizes of beef or veal or eliminating them completely and replacing them with plant-based options, which we do see the more sustainable hotels doing. And I do believe that's going to be a trend in the future. You're going to probably see it mandated in the future and in certain industries around beef just not being on the menu anymore because of what it's doing to the environment. We have just industrial animal farming as a whole is contributing to deforestation. So many of your listeners are probably aware that we're growing a lot of soy, a lot of corn, right? we're growing animal feed, and that is causing deforestation. We're cutting down rainforests, we're, we're clearing land. And because of that, we're having a lot of environmental impacts. And we can talk through you know, what's happening in so many different ways, right? We've got loss of biodiversity because of that. So animals are losing their habitat, wild animals. So there's so much that contributes to the, the degradation of the environment, which is just not a sustainable food system. It's not a sustainable way to feed people. So we do see some of the top resort chains, some of the more sustainable hotels moving toward more sustainable options, whether that is through animal farming, for example, going local or through um, you know even having their own animals on site. Um, we see them trying to buy more plant-based foods, especially from local farmers. So we can see lots of progress. Um, what I encourage the resorts to do and what I do through our new certification program is to create a strategy and really include this in your strategic planning initiatives 
look at what you've changed over the past five years around your culinary programming, how it's become more sustainable, how you've been more inclusive for vegan or vegetarian guests, and think, what do you want to do for the next five years? And create these commitments. So we see commitments being made around animal welfare. For example, many hotel chains have cage-free commitments where they're no longer buying um, eggs from caged hens. They're buying cage-free eggs. And that's a, that's a slight shift in improvement in animal welfare. Now, we would, of course, prefer my company values are we don't need animal foods, so why do we why do we purchase them at all? Um, but we want to encourage any small changes that are being made. So we have shifts in animal welfare. We can have shifts in sustainability. And one thing we also see trending is actually putting emissions calculations on menus or even just putting an LE, which is for low emission, so that we can nudge customers to choose the low emissions types of, of meals. So we can actually have more of these customers who are interested in more sustainable tourism and hospitality. And by virtue of inviting those kind of customers to our properties, we are then going to lower the emissions. We can see making plant-based milks by default at all the coffee shops, for example. If we're not promoting dairy, if we're having dairy as an option, rather than having oat milk as the option, have oat milk as the default, then we're going to reduce emissions there. We have purchasing power in the industry, and those purchases matter. And I really do believe there is a responsibility, especially from the leading chains, that if they start making switches like this, we're going to see a more sustainable industry, and we're going to see it quicker. We know we're going to see it because it has to happen for the future of our planet, but we can have some leaders really be catalysts in this change. And, you know, they, they're the ones that create that, those trends, right? So when the big guys do it, everybody falls in line in, in to some degree. Um, and you're right. It's not going anywhere. It's only going to grow. And consumer preference is really driving um, a lot of these changes. So I think um, your timing is perfect. <laughs> so, all right, let's move on to, um, you know, the wellness demand in the industry right now. It is absolutely huge. Um, tell us about how you see this helping to drive that movement. And it is a part of that movement, right? Absolutely. I was actually just invited to join um, a, a large hotel chain a couple of weeks ago to chat with their chef around creating a wellness offering. And I think that a lot of these hotels are looking to make their wellness menus into vegan menus because it it just checks more boxes. Vegan menus are actually the most inclusive menus. I know that sounds strange because it sounds very niche, but everyone can eat fruits and vegetables. Most people can eat fruits and vegetables. So it's actually more inclusive even than vegetarian because vegetarians can eat vegan food. Vegans won't eat vegetarian food because of the cheese, eggs, and honey. So we want to think, how can we be the most inclusive? And the more plant-based by default we can make our menus, the more inclusive we are. So instead of having vegan customers or vegetarian customers remove items from menus and pay the same, we can have plant-based menus, and then we can have add-ons be the meat and the cheeses and those other items that people want. And um, that is really great for lots of guests, for the wellness-oriented guests, for the guests with allergies, because of course, the, many of the top allergens are animal-based foods. So we want to really consider how can we not just cater to these niche audiences of wellness and vegan, but actually streamline things in the back end in our operations so that it's easy for the hotel. I find that hotels are that are prepared for these um, customers and guests in advance just have a much easier time rather than having to take these as requests and the manager sitting there on email. Okay. Email the chef, email, make sure that the chef um, bounces around to every restaurant. I've seen it all inclusive resorts, a head chef, like literally following the vegan guests, which restaurant do you want to eat at tonight? I'm going to go cook for you at this restaurant. And that is chaos. So we don't need to do that anymore. We can have my company or other companies like mine come and do professional trainings where we can evaluate what you're doing in the back end help you streamline things in the kitchen, make sure there's there's you know minimal cross-contamination opportunities in the back, make sure your servers are trained to speak to guests about these offerings and, um, and sell them as wellness offerings, sell them as vegan offerings, sell them as vegetarian offerings, sell them as sustainable offerings. It's really um, allergy friendly. You know, it's really quite a large group when you think about all the various customer segments that are actually interested in this kind of eating. Um, and you touched on wellness and I'll share one statistic. So 
last year in 2023, there was a study done by two European universities. And you can actually look at the University of Copenhagen's website and you'll find this study. They surveyed 7,500 people in 10 European countries about their diets. And they found that 51% of people claimed they were actually reducing their annual meat consumption. So they looked back at their year and they were like, yes, this year we reduced our meat consumption. And the biggest reason they cited for that was their health. So about half of those 51% of those people said they made that choice for their health. So this is something that we really need to think about. If half, half of the people right, are trying to reduce meat for their health, we need to consider how can we make our menus and our programming more accessible so that people can come and have a great vacation and feel healthy and feel good and not feel guilty or feel like they have to go home and go on a diet. We want people to have choice. And we also want the programming that we offer for our customers to match our company values. So if I'm at a Marriott, for example, my value is embrace change. So if I have that as a core value for my company, I want to think about, okay, how are my menus embracing change? And some of these resorts are doing a great job with it and some aren't yet. And we need to take a look at that from the, the upper level strategically and think, how are we matching our values to the way that we treat our customers, whether it's inclusivity, sustainability as a value, which many companies have, embracing change, people first. These are all values that we see very in alignment with having excellent culinary programming for vegan guests. So this is something I'm really passionate about doing as well, is just making sure companies feel like they're not adding something different or unique or niche, but actually they're just further aligning their own values with their company's own programming. Absolutely. They're just enhancing really their commitments and their offering and really, you know, really validating what they're doing. Um, because there's so much concern with greenwashing. And when you can take your commitments to this, and I don't want to say level because it this this shouldn't be looked at like it's a monumental undertaking, right? I mean, I think of course it takes strategy, it takes time, and it takes, you know, some capital costs, but this is just um making sure that your messaging is is really aligning with what you're doing. And I think you know, that's proof. You know, I came across like statistic as well. And that was that 88% of the American Express 2023 global travel trends reports say they, they plan on spending the same or more on wellness vacations compared to previous years. 72% said that they're more focused on self-care than they were a year ago, and 57% intend to take extended vacations focused on wellness. So, I mean, that's proof right now that this is, um, you know, it's all interconnected, and this is definitely a part of that wellness trend. So, um, so you know, what do you see? Let's, let's move into like some practical things as people are listening and they're thinking about their offerings and their kitchens and how they can enhance them. What kind of mistakes do you see people make, you know, when they're trying to make this transition or maybe ad hoc um, and, and not fully making the commitment? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the biggest mistake comes even before they are making this transition. The biggest mistake that I see is companies assuming that there's no demand for vegan options because they're not getting requests. And this is usually the initial conversation I have with my clients around what is your vision for serving vegan guests? And what would make a vegan guest know that you could serve them? So if you are not getting requests, most likely it's because they're going somewhere else where they know that they can be served. And that's a segment you're missing out on. And it's because maybe you don't have labeled vegan options on your menu. So maybe you are able to accommodate vegan guests and you're doing it upon request. And that is a great place to start. But like I shared before, it's not very efficient for your staff. And it's also not accessible to customers because not everybody's going to ask. You know, we're going to Google and look through menus and choose our vacation based on what we see looks like we could get a good experience. So we're not going to trust that someone's going to say, sure, we'll figure it out. We'll put it together. What we want to do is really, when we're starting this, this thought experiment, think about it from a non-vegan customer perspective. Like if you were just a general public meat eater, would you go to a hotel or a restaurant where they were like, we'll make you something, we'll figure it out. 
probably not. Probably that would not be acceptable for your average guest. So when we're looking at creating a similar experience for a vegan guest, we do need a proper menu for them. We do need to have staff that understands how to respond to their interests, their questions, their, their requests. So if you're not showcasing your vegan options, then you are probably not going to see the return on the, the, the guests you'd like to bring in. And this just really involves creating a vegan guest strategy to make sure that the vegan guest is not an afterthought. Um, but with restaurants and hotels that are actually making the effort, I think that the biggest thing they can do to start is to review their menu labels or actually just label their menus overall, because we still see that there are menus that are missing labels. There are menus that are just not engineered properly to uh, give the right information that guests need to make these honest transparent decisions about what they want to put into their bodies. So we want to make sure ingredients are listed properly, that menus are labeled properly, and it's not just for vegan, but also for gluten-free and any other allergens. We don't want to use the word vegan in the names of the dishes. We see vegan a lot used as an adjective, as if it's going to give us some information about the dish. So we might see vegan burger or vegan tacos. And what research shows is that kind of naming actually lowers the uptake of people ordering that dish. So we don't want to deter people from ordering vegan dishes at the same time as we're trying to be more inclusive of vegan guests. So what we really suggest is making sure that your dish names and descriptions are highlighting the flavors and the tastes and the textures. So we can say black bean burger versus vegan burger. We can say portobello mushroom barbecue taco rather than vegan taco. We want to entice customers to choose the food for the ingredients and the flavor and the experience and not just by virtue of it happen to being plant-based. And we also want to make sure that if we are advertising something as vegan friendly, that it actually is 100% plant-based because we also see a lot of these vegan patties, vegan burger patties on non-vegan buns with non-vegan mayonnaise, with non-vegan cheese. And that is very confusing. And it's a letdown for people to come and have to ask a bunch of questions to ultimately find out they're just going to have a patty with no bun. So we want to make sure we are really checking all the boxes. I mean, when I'm working with clients, we're checking boxes from bread basket to dessert. The vegan guests are not sitting there eating a fruit plate while the other guests are having chocolate cake. Um, we're making sure we look through your wine menu, your drinks menu, to see which vegan-friendly wines you have because the finding process in many drinks includes animal products. We're looking to make sure when you're serving mimosas, your orange juice isn't fortified with omega-3 because that would include anchovies and sardine oil. So there's a lot of details to look into that really require a consultant to look through whatever you're doing and check all the boxes with you. And another mistake would be just not training the front of house staff. So a lot of times we see menu updates, but we don't see front of house staff being included in understanding what exactly they're serving. So when I'm training my clients, I'm making sure that the front of house staff is not only aware, but actually gets to taste the food. And then they can be advocates. So they can say, you should order this tofu scramble because it's amazing and it tastes just like eggs. We use black salt, which gives it a sulfuric taste. You know, they can actually explain the culinary aspects of why this food is good. Um, I once had an experience going to a hotel and trying to order vegan frozen yogurt that they had just come out with. And the person behind the counter said to me, you don't want to order that. That's vegan. It's not a good one. And <laughs> I called over the chef because he's the one who had invited me to come try the vegan option and promote it for them. Oh, and no. I was like, excuse me, did you forget to train your staff? Because this is actually going to impact your bottom line and impact the customer experience. So we really, really need to remember that we have to train everyone. I mean, we even train housekeeping to understand vegan cleaning products. We look at toiletries to make sure they're cruelty free, or at least that there's one vegan suite that is vegan friendly. You know, we look really at every detail so that we make sure that the vegan guest truly has the same quality experience as the traditional guest. And I'll share one more mistake. And that's, doing everything right and not telling anyone about it. We see places that are actually doing a great job and not promoting themselves as vegan friendly, not sharing with vegan travel agents, for example, that they have these changes being made, um, not sharing their motivation behind it, not making their staff ambassadors for this. So when I'm working with staff, I also like to share with them that they're part of the change, they're part of the future, and that Every time they serve a plant-based meal or encourage a customer to try something new, they're actually doing something so great for the environment and for potentially the customer's health. And vegan doesn't always mean healthy. Vegan means no animals were used. So we have to also remember that. Um, but we can 
use plant-based products that are health promoting. And of course we encourage places to do that, especially if they want to make their vegan offering, their wellness offering. So there are a lot of potential mistakes, just like in any field. And I wouldn't let the mistakes deter you from trying. I would say seek out support if you need that kind of support. And remember that it's okay to make a mistake. So if you do get a four-star review from a vegan customer instead of a five-star review, you just want to take that feedback into account and figure out why that was. Oftentimes I see restaurants doing a great job, <clears throat> but then they forget about the dessert. And so the vegan customer is sitting there watching all their friends eat dessert and then they give a four-star review. And the restaurant feels like, oh, we tried so hard. We made this extra effort to have this vegan menu. We deserve a five-star review. But if we really look at it, it was four-star service because that vegan customer didn't have the same experience. So these are the things we want to consider as we're creating these programs. And it really is possible. It isn't that hard. Um, it takes about three to six months to do this full program and do it properly. And for places that I shared, like we're certifying now. So we're certifying hotels that are doing it great, who are setting the standard for vegan-friendly hospitality. Um, for them, our certification process is very quick and smooth because they already have a baseline. So what we're doing is certifying properties that have vegan options that span the length of their average guest stay. So breakfast, lunch, dinner for, let's say your average guest stays for five days and you have options where they can choose from a menu for those five days, you're eligible for certification. We also require them to have dessert options that aren't just fruit and that, that really mirror the experience of the traditional guest. And that's the criteria and also plant-based milk options and taking into account cross-contamination in the kitchen, make sure we're not frying the French fries in the same prior as the, the deep fried fish fingers. So once they meet that criteria, then they get access to our third party verified certification, but they also get access to our staff training program so that all of their staff can become ambassadors for their vegan friendly programming. Their staff gets certified as well. Our certification is compatible with LinkedIn. So their staff can then promote their certifications on LinkedIn and through their social media. And then they also have access to a consultant meeting with our our strategic planning workbook. So a consultant meets with them and then we'll walk them through this workbook so they can actually plan their vegan guest strategy for the future. So they look at what they're doing really well and think, okay, how do we want to even improve to really highlight what we're doing and attract more of this segment as it's a growing population? I mean, we know this is a growing movement. We know it's not getting, it's not going to get less. It's only going to get more as more people are understanding the effects of the plant-based diet on the environment and on their health and on animal welfare. So we do see that this is not so much a trend, but a transition. And my company is really just so proud to be able to help the hospitality transition in this way. And I, you know, I want to add on to something you just said, the trend is, it's going to become more of less of a trend and more of a mainstream um, because they do understand the impact um, that they're creating. But I think in addition to that, people will, are starting to understand that vegan food is delicious. You know, uh, we live in Columbus, Ohio. We have some incredible vegan restaurants that my husband, he is a meat eater, but he has no problem going there. And you do not feel like you're left out of anything. Um, it, it's, it, it's just, it's such a great offering when it's well thought out and you have the right training, like you're saying, it has to be a holistic approach. And you know, the other thing you mentioned was about menus. And I had Jeremy Sampson on the CEO of the Travel Foundation a few months back. And something he mentioned that I think this would have the same effect is when you, first of all, wording and messaging is so important, as you're saying, not labeling something as vegan, because unfortunately, there's a negative connotation to meat eaters, probably, but also about where you are placing that menu item. Placement has a, a huge um, determinant on uptake. And if you even can you know, make that the chef special of the day. You know, there was some statistic that if you made a vegan or a vegetarian meal, the chef special, it was 80% more likely to um, be chosen. So very, very little shifts, you know, after the right things are put into place um, will allow you to see that pull through reduction in cost, reduction in water, energy, and all those good things that, that go along with it. Yeah. I, I love that you mentioned that. I'm, I would call myself a menu engineering geek. 
<laughs> because I'm, I'm always up to date on the latest research on that because I train our consultants to any engineer menus properly to make sure that the vegan options are profitable options because that's another incentive for these places to keep them on their menus. We want them to be profitable. And also vegan options can have higher profit margins if you're using plant-based products like lentils and beans and jackfruit and things that are much cheaper than meat or dairy. So we really can think through this. Um, I worked with a hotel a couple of weeks ago. We are, they're now printing the new menu and we have an entire vegan section and it's just called specialties. That's the name of the section. And at the bottom, we have a note that all the specialties are vegan. So looking at, we have classic choices and specialties that are plant-based and that's such an interesting way to do it, to guide people's eye towards specialties, but not necessarily call everything vegan this, vegan that. And what we also did is create just a lot of their dishes are just defaulted to plant-based. So their pancakes are now just vegan. So that's the only pancake on the menu is a vegan one. And I've also seen this happening also at the major resorts is really not having the vegan products compete with the traditional versions of them. So if you're going to make a Caesar salad, just make your only Caesar salad the vegan one. If you're going to do tacos, make it a vegan shrimp taco, because if someone wants a taco, they'll try that. So not having two of everything and having them all compete with each other, but really having vegan options become mainstream. I worked with a restaurant once where we made a vegan menu and their vegan crab cake was so successful that they ended up putting their vegan crab cake on their traditional menu and taking off the actual crab crab cake. Wow. So there's no crab cake. The only crab cake is the vegan crab cake. So these are things we're going to just see more of in the future. And it's very, very exciting. It is exciting. And, you know, when you were talking about um, the chefs making certain things, you know, when you think about a chef and their creative nature and how much pride they take in their uh, finished product, I would am certain that they probably get so excited about these new creations they're making and these new offerings and what an element of pride they, they have um, after doing that. So it's just such a great way to... Um, you know, really enhance the offering from the guest perspective to your employees perspective, really. So Meredith, you've talked a lot about your certification. So um, as we wrap up, how let's talk about what does that process look like? Um, and can you meet somebody? What if they've started their journey and something's just not working? Or, you know, explain to us how you go in and, and you really get an eye for what's going to gonna help them turn this, turn this dial. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do represent a hotel that you feel is having positive culinary programming for vegan guests, that you do have vegan options that span the guests' day, then I encourage you just to apply on our website. It's veganhospitality.com slash certified because it's free to apply. So you don't pay your annual, annual membership fee until you get accepted to the program. So when you apply, it's essentially a free audit. And what we can do then is take a look at what you're doing. We go through your menus. We look at the statistics you provide for us about your average guest. And we're able to evaluate and let you know, okay, this meets our standards or it doesn't, and here's what you can do next. So we are also offering suggestions on how to improve. And we also offer free free consulting sessions. So anyone can sign up for a free 30 minute, minute session with myself or one of our consultants. I do like to pair the client with a consultant in the region in case they do decide to hire them for work because it's really nice to be able to come in person or at least you know speak the same language, right? If that's If that's a barrier. So it's really nice to just submit the form on our website and I'd be happy to pair you with someone who can help guide you through this process. But like I said, once you do apply for certification, if you do meet the criteria, then we'll invite you to join the program, which will then involve uh, the staff training, which is actually done on recording. So it's a staff training recording that you can then disseminate to your entire staff. Um, I have done some of the, these trainings live for the hotels that are certified in Aruba because it's, it's really fun for me to be able to do this and get real-time feedback. So I did one yesterday. Um, we have three boutique hotels certified in Aruba. I'll mention them briefly. We have uh, Bukuti and Terra, we have Manchebo Resort, and we have Boardwalk Hotel. And these are sustainability pioneers, not just in Aruba, but in the world. And you find that this is a movement really led by boutique hotels. So there are, of course, large chains that are making sustainability commitments, but boutique hotels have had this opportunity to really go above and beyond in ways that they have more control over on their individual properties. And because they're so interested in sustainability, they have already made the connection between 
sustainability in their hotel operations overall and what's going on in their culinary programming. So we are seeing a lot of the boutique hotels applying for this program because they're one step ahead and they're starting to understand already that they're getting vegan guests and they need to have their staff trained so that they can keep up with the five-star reviews and they can make sure that there are no mistakes being made and also so that they can get recognized for their efforts. Because when you are part of our program, and like I shared, it's a new program. We just launched this on Earth Day this year. So it's really new. And we're excited that we've had such a positive response already just in the past month or so. So when you are part of our program, we're also promoting and we are also connecting with travel agents. I have a travel agent um, meeting tomorrow with 10 travel agents around the world talking to them about the program so they can recommend these certified properties to their clients. Because once you have the certification, it's clear that you've met these third party standards. And so we also want to combat greenwashing like you shared and vegan washing, we can call it, where hotels are saying, sure, we can serve vegan guests. And then someone shows up and actually it's not the case. And this happens a lot. I'm part of a vegan travel Facebook group of over 50,000 vegan guests. And I am very up to date on all the stories. And we hear a lot of the same stories over and over from these repeated experiences of hotels saying that they can serve vegans. And it's just not the case when the guest arrives. And of course, not just hotels, but cruise ships, um, but other accommodations. So we are doing our best, making a small ripple effect in the ocean of hospitality and tourism in the best way we can. And what we're really trying to do with the certification is set, set the standard for what it looks like to have a proper vegan culinary experience and a vegan guest experience, because really there is no standard right now. And it, it was sorely needed. And I think over the next year, we'll get to see and evaluate how this program is going. Our plan is to just keep improving it year after year after year based on the feedback we get from the, the members in the program. And, you know, I just want to reiterate, I think, you know, you are enhancing your offering. This is not an all or nothing. You're not saying that you're only serving vegan. What you're doing is you're making sure that you are being able to serve all guests. And the last thing you want to do is have this beautiful experience um, for a guest and well-trained staff and have this missing piece and that ruin, you know, your customer reviews. And so I think this is really something that people um, are going to start digging into. And you are making a huge impact. I'm so thankful that you are doing what you're doing. It's really visionary. And um, I'm so glad you were able to, to come all the way from Aruba and be on the hospitality Sustainable Hospitality Podcast today. Well, remind us one more time, what is your email address? And we're, of course, going to put that into our show notes um, and your website if people want to get in touch. Sure. You can email me directly at meredith at veganhospitality.com. You can also just go to veganhospitality.com. You'll see a list of some of our highlighted consultants and the different regions that we work in. You'll see lots of opportunities to reach out to us and uh, we are also open to partnerships with mission-aligned organizations. We really believe in collaboration, and we really want to make the biggest impact possible. So if anything I've shared resonates with you, I'd love to hear from you and hear what impact you know, I've, this conversation has made on your life. And if you wanted to share it on LinkedIn, tag me. I also love to share information there and read your thoughts. Great. Well, everyone, thank you again for tuning back in. We love being able to bring you innovators like Meredith um, pushing the industry to make a bigger impact because we have such an opportunity to, and consumers are demanding it. But we are asking you to please leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you these great conversations. Let us know what topics and what guests you would like to see. Connect with me on LinkedIn and um, subscribe to our newsletter. If you go to the sustainablehospitalitypodcast.com, um, we're going to give you a great newsletter with all of the tourism sustainability news. Your sound is cutting out a bit right now. I don't know. I don't know if that affected the recording, but I just wanted to let you know the last sentence was a bit 